biological proof. I, I, as far as I understand it, there is some potential evidence, but there's no biological proof. So uh, what Steph is referring to here, he's talking about there's no evidence or proof. Well, there might be some potential evidence, which actually means there's no evidence or proof for the position which he's defending. And this is what I just wanted to point out before I got into the arguments that he was making in defense of free will. Which, and to be fair, he at least admitted at the beginning that there is no evidence for free will, nor is there any proof. But it's still something that he strongly defends for some reason, which I'll get into later. Human consciousness is specific and unique and has characteristics that no other cluster of matter and energy in the universe that we know of possesses. And so Steph is essentially telling you it's true. All of our observations, the whole scientific process is based on determinism. We couldn't do science if it wasn't for determinism. If we we're just to say that specific conf configurations of matter are just able to completely circumvent the process of causation, then in essence, you are discarding the whole scientific process. It doesn't make sense to say that we're able to replicate experiments and that we need observations to be consistent through our reality, which means that if you do this, that happens. That's what's the basic foundation of science. But somehow here, Steph holds the belief that with human consciousness is somehow exempt to the rule that we've observed that applies to everything else that is composed, anything that's made of matter, uh, actually anything that exists in defense of free will, he's pretty much uh, rejecting science. It's, I mean, it's, it's close-ish. I mean, uh, basically, uh, uh, if you, you will only ever debate with a human consciousness. You will never debate with a chair or a balloon or the weather or a computer or anything like that. And, and that has no bearing on causation. That has no bearing on the argument that is just a red herring that, like, that Steph likes to throw out there to uh, confuse people. See, the thing is, uh, different configurations of matter act and behave differently you know this is just just common sense you don't uh you're not going to put your hands in a fire that doesn't mean that you're not going to put your hands in a in a bucket of water the difference is is the elements that compose them and the chemical reactions that are currently taking place there are millions of chemical reactions taking place within human beings that enable them to act certain ways to where your toaster does not have millions of chemical reactions going on within it. It, it doesn't have, it's, it's a very simple. That's why we could say the human mind is one of the most, com is the most complex thing we know in the universe. Because we know it's composed of all these different processes and chemicals that are, that are, you know, doing things to make it act the way it does. Now, if you compare, instead of talking about a toaster, let's say you have a cell phone with Siri, the app, and you talk to it and it talks back to you. In essence, it's doing the same thing a human being does. It's taking an input, which is your voice. And then based on that input, it's predetermined, it's pre-programmed to give out certain responses, which is the same thing that happens when you talk to a person. Uh, a way to discount Steph's argument is to say, uh, we don't always have to debate with people. You know, most of the time, uh, it's not a debate that happens. Most of the time, you just program the people you're around. If I walk next to someone and I make a loud noise and that person uh, jumps and cowers and f turns the other direction because of that loud noise and I startle them. I didn't debate this person. I just treated this person like a rock. The same way I could kick a rock and he's going to roll down a hill, I could make a person move. Because I know it's just another computer. Even though it could act complex and it's a lot of people that have long conversations with Siri. <laughs> Thinking that they're actually talking to a consciousness. You could replicate this because it's just another mechanism of nature. And the fact that we could replicate it in a $30 cell phone means that it's not really that tricky to debate a person. It's the, the, the act of debating, the fact that the only reason debating a person is relevant is because another human being is a configuration of matter that you don't know what its output will be. You know, that's just like Siri. When you ask Siri a question, you don't know what the answer is going to be sometimes. So you, you, you don't know. So when you get an answer based on what it gives you, you might ask another. It's happening when you're talking to a person and debating them because you don't know this person's full history. You don't know this person's genetic disposition. So when you speak to a person, 
you don't know what you're getting back in response. You, you don't know what the answer will be. That's why you talk to the person to find out. And based on what that person tells you back, you might say, oh, well, this person believes this. And I and I bet they haven't been exposed to this information. So if someone comes and tells me, oh, uh, you know, I have a lot of friends come by and tell me this thing about the uh, the mermaids being real. A lot of my friends still come to me and say, oh, you know, they found mermaids, right? You know, mermaids are real. Based on what they told me, I could turn around and tell them, um, no, actually, that was a fake. That was a documentary. It was a, kind of like a joke. And I could show them the evidence. And five minutes later, they believe something completely different. And 30 minutes later, when someone else comes up to them telling them, hey, mermaids are real, they'll do the same thing I did. Just because uh, they're pre-programmed, same way I've pre-programmed. The, the only way I was able to give them that response was because based on the things I was exposed to, I, I came across that information. So it's a long way of answering Steph's uh, question, but... Pretty much this is showing that his argument that you can only debate a human consciousness. First and foremost is, fault, is false. You could actually debate machines and you debate your computer and computers have errors. And I've spent a lot of time working on computers that do things that I did not expect. And I'm having to go through and figure out what they're doing and interact. Sure, we're not talking to each other. I'm typing on the keyboard and moving a mouse. But the way I'm interacting with the machine is all the... Everything has been predetermined as far as what my composition is, what my thoughts are, what my knowledge is, and what I might remember or not remember to do. That's all been predetermined. I don't choose what I'm going to remember. Sometimes I'm working on a problem for hours, then I remember something. Oh, yeah, I've done this before. This is the way to solve it. Why did that knowledge not pop up before? I don't know. But you can't tell me that I have free will if I don't even have free dominion and control over the things that pop up in my consciousness, which I've actually went out of my way to expose myself to. But you still forget. So Steph's argument here is kind of simplistic and is very misleading in many ways. And it's just a way he uses to shut down people, which uh, doesn't make any sense. Now, the biggest thing that I want to get into about why I believe Steph does this is because he has an emotional attachment to, you know, blaming, you know, to blaming people for their actions in certain ways. And which I understand I could relate to that in many ways. It's an emotional reaction. But that doesn't change the fact that we do live in the <laughs> deterministic universe. And um, for instance, the whole premise of Steph's show is to show people that if you give children a, diff a certain childhood, if you treat a human baby a certain way, or in essence, if you program it a certain way, as an adult, it will function much better than it would otherwise. This is an argument for determinism. It's not an argument for free will. The argument for free will in this instance would be if, if we were to say it doesn't really matter how you treat your child. It doesn't really matter what you do to them, they're still going to come out however they, they choose to come out because they always have free will. If that's the argument, if, if, if Steph is so vehemently defending free will, then he can't really be telling parents that they have to treat their children better. It doesn't because it's not going to matter. They still have free will. They still have an intact soul, supposedly somewhere which which could always make the right decisions or which just may choose to make the wrong decision. So to conclude, free will does not sit well with science. Free will is completely unscientific. If we were to apply the logic of free will with anything else, then we would just stop researching anything because, hey, that it might just choose to do something else. You know, the animal might just choose to do something else. What's the point of doing uh, studying animal biology? What is the point of neuroscientists? What is the point of psychology? If we're to say that people just do whatever they want, then all the psychological findings, which the reason you do study is to, the reason you study a topic is to learn the cause and effect and the mechanisms that dictate the behavior of that certain configuration. So whether we're looking at a child, a monkey, a dog, it's all a different configuration of atoms and cells. That's all it is. And different configurations are going to respond differently, obviously, you know.
if I was to pour cyanide onto my computer, you know, onto my computer, it's not going to die. But if I if I inject cyanide in a person, it dies. You see what I mean? There's a difference. It's a different configuration of matter. That, that That's completely irrelevant to whether causation exists. And if causation is a fact, you can't dance around it. And that's all Steph is doing. He's trying to dance around causation and act as if, oh, well, just because I have this experience that I made a choice, which all the science, which is what I don't get. Steph talks to all the scientists and all the science is conclusive. That's mostly an illusion. The, the, the fact that you think you made a choice, that's your brain giving you an experience after the fact. The decision has been made by your atoms, your cells, the, the billions of bacteria in your body and everything else interacting. All that has made the decision way before your puny little consciousness saw what the uh, experience that you made a choice and to fall prey to this very simple illusion kind of puts you in a very shady light you should look into sam harris's work sam harris clearly deals with this in a irrefutable way there's really nothing you could do to to dispute what Sam Harris has. And I've seen you actually bring up some of his work. You've never brought up most of his arguments. You've never brought up the vast majority of his arguments. You just ignore them by saying, well, you can't, you, well, what's the point of debating a human being? That's what I'm predisposed to do. What's the point of breathing? I'm predisposed to breathing. That's why I do it. it what's the, what do you mean? What's the point of being alive? That's a stupid question in and, in and of itself to ask what's the point of debating? What's the point of being alive? If there's no purpose to being here in the first place, you can't question the purpose of anything I do after the fact of being here. If I'm if I'm going to be alive anyway and I have to live next to people like you who might believe certain ideas that are wrong, I'm predisposed to m might try to correct you. I don't see that that I don't see your argument here, Steph. You completely lost me with this one. Usually I do get when you use self-defeating arguments in the defense of a uh, universally preferable behavior. Because that makes sense. For you to say something is right or wrong, you're already invoking the concepts of right and wrong. So you can't then go back and say that it doesn't matter whether you do right or wrong because everybody speaks and acts in a way that right or wrong make a difference. So just to even converse with someone, just to engage in a debate, you admitting that there's a correct way and there's a wrong way, which is why you are trying to appeal to the correct way of doing things. That makes perfect sense. But to say that if I debate you, then all of causation goes out the window, then there's no cause, you know, previous to my knowledge. So I'm the first cause for why I debated you. It's not the millions of years of evolution and the thousands of years of human culture. That's not why I'm debating you. It's just because I just thought of it now and I just free willed it. Come on, man. That makes no sense.